I wanted to ask uh, Ambassador Pam White to just make a couple of comments. She's graciously agreed to join us and uh, her reflections initially on the presentations. And anything else? I've uh, spent for the last 40 years in development. I was head of huge aid programs in Mali and Tanzania and Liberia, and, uh, US uh, ambassador to the Gambia and to Haiti. So I know a thing or two about development. And uh, first of all, aid, development, aid uh, uh, as we give to Africa or any other place in the world is not going to say solve Africa's problems. It's just not. We, give, we have about $30 billion a year in aid. Uh, it took $142 billion to fix Katrina, uh, New Orleans after Katrina. So you can see, uh, you know, New Orleans, $142 billion, the world, $30 billion. Uh, it, it ain't kind of so solve anybody's problems. So we've got to change the way we uh, give aid to Africa. What we've done in the past cannot continue in the future. I'm afraid we're just going to keep banging our head against the wall. But let me be really quick here, because I know you want to ask questions. But first of all, we've got to stop the pixie dust. What we do, we love to get, say, oh, we built three wells, and they danced, and they loved us, and look at this, and this fabulous. <laughs> well, no, it's not fabulous. It didn't make a difference. It's not long term. It's not sustainable. It's not transformational. But let's choose how we give aid so that it is transformational and not just makes us all feel good. And so we can get back to the Congress and say, look at this picture of me dancing with the chief of blah, blah. So, the, the, the PEPFAR initiative, which was $15 billion mm. over five years, is an example of 12 countries <coughs> originally were chosen, $15 billion five, uh, over five years, $3 billion a year. That was enough to make real transformation in Africa. And if George Bush did nothing else right in his term, that he did right. That Absolutely. saved millions of lives. Absolutely. I was not a huge fan. I'm, I'm left of you know, the Kennedys. But the fact of the matter is that that was worth clapping about. And he did save millions of lives. And it was strategic. And it was transformational. And we need to do more of that kind of thing in the future. The, 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 one of the favorite things of the, of the Congress and therefore of aid is let's get more girls in school. Please, more girls in school, which is a good thing. Uh, but we only have money for primary education. Honeys, that's not going to change Africa. It's not going to change the world. If you don't get girls into high school, into tertiary education, just forget it. It is not going to change the way their outcomes in their lives. For example, they have just as many children if they only get through uh, sixth grade as if, as if they didn't go to school at all. They, they, their long-term life expense, expect city doesn't change. Their life earnings don't change. We have got to change our focus on education in third world countries. And I hate that term, third world countries. But that's got to change, and it's got to change quickly. I'm, I'm afraid it's not going to do. And we've got to realize that terrorism, well, I don't, you know, what, I don't care what you call it, ISIL, Boko Haram, whatever it is, it is not going to go away, my friends, by bombs. It is going to go away when we give the young people a better choice. Because let me tell you, when I was in, when I was in uh, Mali and we, we started seeing the terrorists uh, organizing in northern Mali, they would come into Timbuktu, one of the greatest cities on earth for you know, centuries. And they would go into Timbuktu and they would have uh, jeans, tennis shoes, and 100 bucks, and that was their recruiting mechanism. And it worked every time. We need to give the unemployed, the uneducated, the disenchanted youth a better choice. And I don't care where it is in the world. We've got our own disenchanted youth right here in the United States of America, thank you very much. And they are also looking for better choices. So let's work together to figure out what that is. Because if you think that, that, that from 20, 2050, another billion Africans are going to be on this earth. And if you don't think that's going to affect you and your grandchildren, you must be smoking something that maybe I wish I had right now. <laughs> so let's stay engaged in the world. We are interconnected. It is, I mean, globalization is not going away. And how we, uh, how we react to it is going to be life changing. Last thing is, it is great, I think, to insist on American ideals. And you know, we do have great ideas, you know, freedom of press, freedom of expression, democracy, but we don't need to sell our implementation. 
And democracy, when I was a, a Peace Corps volunteer in a little tiny village, I saw democracy in its rawest form, and it was great. It was a council of elders that would sit in the village square once every other week, and people, the, the village, everyone would gather around. It was kind of an entertainment. We did not have TV in those days, let me assure you, or cell phones or anything else you did all the time. Anyway, we'd sit around on the village square, and they would say, but, you know, he took over my piece of land. She's in my market stall. Uh, he's sleeping with her. <laughs> this is not good. Anyway, whatever they wanted to discuss on the village square, it was, it was, it was uh, discussed in an open way. The village elders talked out loud. They did their reasoning out loud. Everyone had a chance to participate. A decision was made, and they went on. That was democracy in my village. It was good democracy. I'm not so sure how good our democracy is working in the United States right now. <laughs> but in any case, we, do, we don't have to sell our exact implementation of our ideals to others. Let's learn from them. I have learned more from Africa and a thousand percent than I've ever taught. Thank you. I, I told you that Pam speaks her mind. <laughs> <laughs> let's take some questions. Uh, yes, in the, uh, let's see, where do we have a, a card? Yes, in the, way in the back, one of the students. Yes, ma'am. Right, number three, that's it. I don't know how you see any of them. I know. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Samantha Morse. I'm a junior at the University of Maine with a major in political science. Um, my question for you is, in your opinion and experience, what percentage of foreign government aid that African countries receive is out of pure personal interest, though I know most are genuine in the continent's national resources, especially oil. I, I think, I think King, can, I, King, I, yeah, yeah, can yeah, you yeah, please, yeah. Um, I am tempted to say, uh, the question was how, what percentage is genuine? Yeah. Or in I would say maybe 2%. <laughs> wait, wait. Generous. The, the truth is, the truth is, the truth is that aid is driven by a mixture of factors. Yes. One of which is um, altruism for those who have a guilt complex about redistribution. <laughs> That's very cynical. Of global wealth. <laughs> of global wealth. So, and some have a sense of global justice and so that that should drive helping people who are poor in other societies, so they're well-intentioned. Now, but a lot of aid is about geostrategic power projection. Yes. We give you aid, this matter is coming up at the UN, we expect you will vote in this way. It's a tool of power, it's soft power, that's the reality. Now, a lot of African countries are only just beginning to understand this. And one of the reasons they're just beginning to understand it is because of this problem I talk about, about the absence of a worldview. Because every country that has a worldview or develops one, as soon as they develop a worldview, the next thing they want to do is to become a donor of aid, not a recipient. India is now a donor. China is now a major aid donor. Brazil is now a major aid donor. South those Africa. countries, South Africa, those countries used to receive aid at some point, but they're now rising in the world. And so they're playing the same game that the old imperial powers have played for, for a long time. So that's the answer to the question. And now there is another, a final point. Aid is also big business. Yes. You've got the aid industrial complex. Yep. That's true, just like you have the military industrial complex, which produces the weapons, they are businesses, they've got to make money. And so if there is no war in 10 years, the shareholders are not going to smile. So there's got to be war, the weapons will be bought, used, and profit is made. This is the way also it works. Um, so the, the businesses that produce what is used for, especially humanitarian assistance, you know, so there is also that incentive. So it's a mixture of incentives. Now, the more important thing which Pamela talked about is that aid actually is not completely useless. It's not, <laughs> it's not transformational. It's a vote of confidence. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree with it. You, you know, 
uh, one of the things, I, I'm happy to be an African telling you this. I'm really happy to be an African telling you this. Because the, the way that aid can actually help is not the way it's done. If, if you were to fund transformational initiatives in education, if you were to fund the commercialization of innovation, Africans are inventing things. But taking those inventions to market and turning it into wealth is not happening. If somebody who was in the development business were to focus in that space, it would be helpful. Go. But just going on and giving people a handout, 70% no. of which returns to the donor in yeah. various ways, your salaries yeah. or your consultants or procurement from the country that is giving the aid. Give me a break. Okay, I, it's not. Can I just? That's my worldview. Seventy <laughs> <laughs> percent. Uh, just, just a couple of things. I, th I do think there have been many mistakes within um, uh, USAID. I mean, what, uh, U.S. assistance. Uh, one of the things is is that it's determined by what the U.S. taxpayer payer is going to be willing to support. I mean, no country does anything purely from the goodness of its heart. That's not, not what not. That's just not what countries do. Um, I do think, and, and I do question the 70% uh, figure across all aid programs. I mean, uh, if you look at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, these are grants that are given to countries, 500, mil 500 million in some cases, given to countries that are seen by objective criteria to be performing well economically, uh, in governance and base, in delivering basic services. Unlike other countries, they get a grant that they can use to their own purposes. And they don't, when they procure, they do not have to procure from US businesses. Thank uh, God. They open the bid, and Chinese companies have won those bids, others have, have won those bids. Um, there's some pushback in the United States yeah. against that. <laughs> the Congress but, is not happy. But yeah. that, that is not, that is how it was structured. China will go in with a big loan, but the loan is tied to the fact that it has to bid on, on, US, on Chinese companies Absolutely. to co come in to do that. Yeah. Um, on HIV AIDS, uh, you know, back in 2000, when this was bandied about, you know, we were writing a piece on how much the US should give, and the thought was that one billion would be um, almost too much to ask a, a Bush administration. You know, he came forward with, with 15 billion over, over, you know, over, over five years, which is a huge amount. Um, and I think that did have transformative effect. It's, A, I mean, it had its flaws in that it was very, an emergency plan that rather than build the structures of health, delivered uh, treatment directly. And so it kind of bypassed na national. And that, that's a debate to be had. But it did save millions of lives, and it proved for the first time that treatment for HIV AIDS could be done in a low income setting. Previous to that, you had the administrator of, of, H yep, of USAID saying, you know, these Africans, they don't have watches. They're not going to be able to t take their meds on time. We yeah, can't right. do it in low-income countries. <laughs> this really shifted yeah. that and showed what was possible. So that's why, I, I, you know, I think for all the flaws, and I was a critic of some of the, the ways that that was done, um, it, was it was truly transformative in that way. It also prompted hundreds of young Americans into public health schools um, who then began to engage in Africa in different ways. And I mean, maybe that's something, too, to think about is, you know, does it all have to be through government USA contractors and so forth? A, a bigger challenge, and you know, my hope is that you get a bigger swath of Americans whether it's universities, science establishment, young people, public health experts, medical, um, engaging, uh, so that the, the official government assistance flows becomes much less of an important factor in that. Just very quickly, um, I think we need to differentiate between aid as humanitarian assistance and aid, what is called ODA, official development assistance. Uh, which is what I think largely has failed. That is to say, aid with the promise that it will bring development to developing to poor countries. Mm. That has not happened. Now, if there's an earthquake in Maine, God forbid, a lot of people are going to bring aid, including Japan, including Saudi Arabia. Um, that's humanitarian assistance. 
Now, We're good at that. Yeah. Now, just to say as well that this is why the actual part of aid that has made impact is some of the things that Jennifer is talking about, and especially what Bill Gates is doing. You know, what the private foundations like the Gates Foundation is doing, you know, trying to eradicate polio um, across many African countries, and they've done very well, and I think they should get credit. You know, but my problem with aid is that the way it is seen in many developing, developed countries and in many African countries as well is that this is something we need to develop. That is just not so not true. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I do want to go to we another question. We want to keep talking about the, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, please. Number two. A Fabia told me on Friday night to wait until this panel to ask about corruption. How do we replace <laughs> corruption with the rule of law? And that, my friends, would be transformational. Yeah. Uh, For the U.S. Beg your pardon? Would you mind if I ask a related No, please. Quickly, yeah. I, I wonder if, um, if the focus on corruption is somehow uniquely American, and if this is one of the divergences yeah, that you have re question. referenced between American views and African views, because this weekend we've heard a number of speakers say, well, right. yes, corruption's an issue, and so-and-so is going to speak about that later, and so-and-so never really did speak about it. So I think related to this question, is this an American obsession, or how big a problem is this in the African view as well? Great. Thank you. I will Can speak I to you. Okay. Kingsley, you yeah. have the floor. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jennifer. As, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Jennifer, you Jennifer. first. It's okay. No, All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> from the horse's mouth here. So. Okay, well, depends on how you define the horse. Exactly. Um, <laughs> It'll be the American horse next. <laughs> <laughs> the African horse. But this is not a corrupt horse. Um, but, yeah, that's, but, a, yes, <laughs> that's what I meant. <laughs> but anyway, uh, look, corruption is hugely important. I mean, it has, it, it has played a very um, strong role in the process of you know, robbing Africa of opportunities to transform. Um, it's a major form of misgovernance in the continent. Now, that is clear. But I want to say, first of all, corruption is a global problem. It's not a problem that's unique to Africa. A lot of times when it's discussed exclusively as if it's an African problem, I think that's not correct. Now, but we as Africans should very rightfully be concerned about the impact of corruption in our societies. It's not a defense to say, well, it happens elsewhere, and therefore we should condone it. No, absolutely not. In my country today, the president of Nigeria, Muhammadu Buhari, was elected on an anti-corruption platform. These are citizens who took the power into their hands to change a government they felt was weak on fighting corruption and to put in place somebody with a very obvious commitment to fight this, this scourge. So it's changing. So we don't want the single narrative about Africa, corruption, corruption, corruption. Let's also talk about anti-corruption and how it is developing in the continent. I once spoke at an event and someone talked about these funny letters you get supposedly from Nigerians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, some yeah. of them, a lot of them, if you just Google Kings Lemoyalu, you will see a lot of people pretending to be me and writing to you <laughs> and, 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 and telling you about stories about you know, their father's will and estate and bank, you know, whatever. And I said to the guy, why is this thing so rampant in this society? It must be because some people here too yeah. are very greedy. Why would you get an email? <laughs> telling you about a business you never did, you did not invest in, and you're getting into that conversation. Yeah. And then when you end up being swindled, you begin to complain. <laughs> you were greedy. That's why you went into that discussion. So, and they're playing on that human nature of greed. So, so let's talk about the anti-corruption effort as well. It's huge as well. Um, but it remains a challenge in the continent. And let's also uh, talk about, you know, the multi multinationals that are involved in many African economies and how they are sometimes a conduit for, for this. I mean, mm -hmm. in Nigeria, we've been trying to change the petroleum industry's uh, 
you know, there's legislation. But the multinationals are not letting go. And people mm. know that it's because they are, you know, buying off, you know, vested interests to agree with them and to prevent the passage of these kinds of legislatures, uh, legislations that would make the oil industry or the extractive industries much more transparent. So there are a lot of interests that are vested in corruption. But, but I think there's some progress. Jan, you had one. Yeah, I mean, it, back when I was in uh, college, it used to be there was very popular, I think Samuel Huntington said, corruption is kind of the grease that helps these economies yeah. go. And it was yeah. kind of like, OK, uh, Africa, it's, that's kind of the norm in, in Africa. I mean, how very wrong that is. And if you go to Nigeria right now or to Kenya, uh, talk to anybody that's not in the government, um, you'll see that it is a very African obsession. Uh, it's not simply an American obsession. I think there's two aspects on how, how does the US help with that look, as it was said, you know, the US can't fix things uh, uh, necessarily. Um, there's two aspects of corruption. I think one is kind of the political will side and, and corrupt individuals. The second is institutions that catch and can stop, uh, reveal, and prosecute corruption. Um, you know, plenty of corruption in this country. We, we have better mechanisms to catch it and, and to pursue it. Um, so for, in, in terms of the United States role in this would be helping to, uh, with technical capacity in some of the economic financial crimes com commissions, for example, in the judiciary, uh, in forensic accounting uh, support and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, so so the, in regulations, in transparency, also investing in civil society groups that can help monitor. There's some really fascinating stuff happening in Nigeria of groups that are putting the budget up in a way that the public can understand and so, so then track. Um, and this is my pet thing in, in investigative journalism. Uh, and you know, investigative journalists are very much at risk because of the difficulty of funding media uh, right now. But you know, it's, it's them that go in, you know, with no fear uh, to, to discover these things. So there, there's that aspect of anti-corruption as well. And then the third, you know, there's a huge case in Nigeria right now of, a, of an oil block that was um, given illegally uh, the, uh, the Shell and any uh, two major oil companies bought from uh, a corrupt man who was a funnel for the, for the government. It's a transnational case. You need, you need the Italian legislature working. You need the UK legislature working. You need the US. Um, you have to build those kinds of transnational networks on this. And the rest of the world needs to do it, its part. I would recommend this report that was done by the Kofi Annan Africa Progress Panel. It's called Equity and Extractives, that talked about how much wealth from just Democratic Republic of Congo left far more than any amount of humanitarian assistance or development assistance. Um, and the point was, it's not just the Congolese, it's, it's the extractors and the companies yeah. who have tax shelters here, who have companies behind companies behind companies, uh, shell companies and beneficial uh, uh, ownership. Um, and there's a big push, there was a big push that the UK at the G8 and perhaps at the G20 did on global tax transparency standards, uh, on beneficial ownership declaration if, you, if you're listed on a stock exchange. And so there's, there's a part that the United States can push for in championing those kinds of issues as well as uh, just kind of trying to fix African problems. The EFCPA, the... Uh, uh, FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, that's, that's gotten a lot more play now in Africa as US firms going in are held responsible and get massive fines if they're found um, doing the wrong things. So th there are things that we can do just to, to take the stick out of our own eye for the, for the time being. Well, the, the, the bad news is we're out of time for this. Oh, no. <laughs> we could continue for hours. But the good news is, if we come back promptly uh, at 11 o'clock, we'll have 75 minutes for an extended conversation with the entire group of speakers. Okay. So let's give this group a hand. <laughs>